Again, good morning, everybody. Happy Tuesday morning. My name is Kevin Burns. I'm the mayor of Geneva, Illinois, located about 35 miles due west of Chicago. I have the pleasure of serving as the executive board chairman of the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus and the Environment Committee and Energy Subcommittee chairman of the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus. This morning, we are gathered to discuss the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022, which, of course, we all know puts the United States on a path toward achieving the goal of the Paris Climate Accord by enabling emissions reductions of between 31% and 44% below 2005 levels, while also funneling billions of dollars to local municipalities and resilience needs. The landmark legislation for the first time provides tax exempt entities, including folks like us in the local government, the opportunity to receive the monetary benefit of a tax credit directly from the federal government. We are grateful to be joined by experts on the IRA and direct pay from the National League of Cities, which is the oldest and largest national organization representing municipal government. Our friends from the U.S. Conference of Mayors, the official nonpartisan organization of cities with populations of 30,000 or more. And they bring with us an old friend from ACOM. That's to you, Bill, by the way. We're going to introduce the entire panelists today, then they're going to hand it off to each succeeding speaker. So please join me in a warm welcome to the following who are joining us. Carolyn Berent will start us off with an overview of the Inflation Reduction Act. Carolyn is the Legislative Director for the Sustainability on the Federal Advocacy Team at the National League of Cities, where she leads advocacy, regulatory, and policy efforts on energy and environmental issues, including water, infrastructure, climate change, brownfields, and solid and hazardous waste. Cassidy Klein is the Environment Staff Associate at the U.S. Conference of Mayors, working alongside the Environment Committee and Mayor's Water Council. Cassidy covers issues related to water, wastewater, federal climate legislation, environmental policy, climate mitigation, and resiliency. Bill Abelt leads ACOM's energy practice and focuses on energy, sustainability, and smart, resilient urban infrastructure in the largest metropolitan economies in North America. Bill is a true Chicagoan, having served under Mayor Richard M. Daley as Environment Commissioner, Director of the Office of Budget and Management, and Chief of Management in the Mayor's Office, where he was responsible for developing Chicago's strategy to become one of the greenest cities in America. Bill also worked with the caucus, this caucus, on multiple sustainability issues. Our friend from Washington, D.C., Mike Gleason, is the Legislative Director of Finance, Administration, and Intergovernmental Relations on the Federal Advocacy Team at the National League of Cities. Our friend Mike leads NLC's advocacy, regulatory, and policy efforts on issues including municipal finance issues, census, and local democracy. He co-leads efforts around the American Rescue Plan Act's state and local funds for over 19,000 communities across the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, with that, I'm going to turn it over to my friend who's going to provide us an overview of IRA funding for clean energy and sustainability projects. Please say hello and provide a warm welcome to Carolyn Berent, Legislative Director for the Sustainability and Federal Advocacy Team at the National League of Cities. Carolyn. Thank you, Mayor Burns. Uh, it's good to be here. And I want to thank the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus for inviting us all to speak today. Uh, at the Environment Committee meeting. Uh, yeah, we can go just right to the next slide. Thanks. So um, I just want to take a moment and take a step back and remember that in the last three years, Congress has passed three major pieces of legislation that can support climate action and clean energy at the local level. So first, we have local governments with the American Rescue Plan Act, uh, state and local fiscal recovery funds, those funds can be used for necessary investments in water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure, and green infrastructure investments in projects that address the impacts of climate change or improve resilience to climate change were expressly allowed and even encouraged. And second, we have the bipartisan infrastructure law, 
which includes tremendous funding opportunities for local governments around transportation, water, broadband, and energy. Uh, the climate change and resilience funding really falls into three main categories, strengthening infrastructure against extreme weather events, transportation, um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions from transportation sector, and investing in clean energy. And finally, the Inflation Reduction Act, this funding falls into four bucket areas, improving building stock, reducing emissions from transportation, similar to Bill, and reducing greenhouse gas emissions overall and improving air quality and improving natural resources and agriculture. And the IRA also offers new and expanded tax credits for individuals and households to transform their energy use and consumption, and importantly, for the private sector and local governments for renewable energy investment and production. And this is the direct pay provision that we're gonna get into today. I wanna to mention all this because it's just an important reminder that all of these things can work together in terms of meeting your uh, clean, uh, cl clean action, uh, climate action goals. Um, so here's just uh, Inflation Reduction Act, a closer look, which is largely focused on the tax credits. So as you can see from this chart, about 70% of the overall package on clean energy and investments from the IRA is going from the tax incentives. This is the orange, turquoise, red, and purple slices of this graph. And the other slices represent the grant programs under, II, under I, IRA, which I mentioned previously. And we can go to the next slide. So here's a closer look at a high level at the direct pay and the consumer tax credits and rebates and before we get into them more specifically. So under the Inflation Reduction Act, for the first time, local governments are positioned to take advantage of the many energy tax credits directly. IRA includes a provision that provides non-taxable entities investing in and producing clean energy with a direct payment option in lieu of taxes, in lieu of tax credit. Under the IRA, direct pay applies to states, cities, counties, tribes, and other tax-exempt entities such as municipal water and power utilities and school districts. For city leaders, direct pay is an option for funding city-owned clean energy projects that will make these projects more affordable and level the playing field between the local governments and the private sector, which has traditionally benefited from tax credits. So local governments can take advantage of the direct pay option under a variety of tax credits for both production of and investment in clean energy. And it's important to note that there are specific requirements around prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements that local governments will have to meet and extra considerations that will boost the value of the direct payment, such as direct content, projects in low-income communities, and more. And again, we have a um, lot more slides on this as well. Um, additionally, the IRA provides a variety of tax credits and rebates aimed at individuals and households. And this includes from home energy efficiency improvements to rooftop solar and electric vehicles. And these tax credits are generally available to individuals now uh, through their 2023 federal tax returns. And then finally, consumer rebates. So from the Inflation Reduction Act, there's about $9 billion for home energy rebate program, which is available for a single family and multifamily homes. The, pro the program makes funding available to every state to create a rebate program and really is comprised of two parts. Um, the first is home efficiency rebates and the second is home electrification and appliance rebates. These programs will be run out of the state energy office and they're responsible for applying to the Department of Energy to get their allocated funding. In terms of timing, DOE has released the program guidance last summer, and now states have until the end of this summer to indicate whether they will accept this funding. And with that final application due in 2025, um, although many states will likely apply before then. So for both the tax credits and the rebates, local leaders have an important role to play in helping their residents understand and take advantage of these opportunities. Um, and that's it for me, and I will turn it over to Cassidy. 
Thanks, Carolyn. It's a pleasure to speak with you all today. As the mayor mentioned, my name is Cassidy Klein and I work with the environment staff. I am the environment staff associate with the U.S. Conference of Mayors. For those not familiar, the Alliance for Sustainable Future is a joint initiative between the conference and with the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions, also known as C2ES. The purpose of the Alliance is to bring together both the public and the private sectors to identify innovative solutions to climate change. We've worked together for a number of years alongside some key partners, such as AECOM. We produce case studies, we identify best practices, and we highlight the public-private sector partnerships. As Carolyn mentioned earlier, along with the historic investments made through the Inflation Reduction Act, local governments now, for the first time ever, have the opportunity to receive the monetary benefit of tax credits directly from the federal government. This is a game changer because as local leaders continue to take the lead on climate mitigation and adaptation, reaching our sustainability goals will be absolutely critical in achieving long-term progress. And as you're probably all aware, funding represents one of the biggest barriers cities face in implementing sustainability projects. And so now with, with direct pay, local governments have new opportunities to make these types of projects more um, affordable. To help mayors and city leaders understand this new financial tool and how best to leverage these new tax credits, the Alliance, along with AECOM, released a new report titled Unlocking the Potential of the Inflation Reduction Act. The report, it dives into the basics of direct pay. It outlines um, which of the tax credits will be useful to cities, as well as the, the different opportunities to increase the value of those credits. Additionally, this publication actually features case based on real world municipal projects, showcasing exactly how these new tax credits can help cities save millions on investing in new clean energy projects, such as electric vehicle fleets, charging stations, and microgrids. Because we know that cities are on the front line of climate action, both with reducing our greenhouse gas emissions and with increasing resiliency, our hope was that by highlighting some of these local examples, cities and local leaders such as yourselves would feel more confident in navigating this new tool. With that being said, I'm happy to now turn it over to Bill to go more into direct pay and our report. Thank you. Thanks, Cassidy. I really want to underscore the point that, uh, that Cassidy made, that this is a real game changer for, for local governments. Uh, a, a number of you have been used to uh, private uh, transactions, uh, particularly related to economic development, where there is significant tax benefit uh, to entities with, uh, with a tax liability. Uh, but in this instance, uh, the tax credit is available to, to governments, units of governments, uh, and not-for-profits, uh, and can be accessed for specific purposes by filing a tax return. Uh, this, uh, this slide just lists some of the some of the areas where the the uh, tax credits are available and can be monetized from you know clean electricity, uh, fuels and vehicles uh, to carbon reductions and manufacturing. Now we want to talk a little bit if we can go to the next slide about how uh, how uh, which ones make the most sense for uh, for communities. Uh, working with the Conference of Mayors and uh, C two E S. Uh, we evaluated the IRA uh, and sought to identify those credits that uh, were in most demand for municipal uh, municipal use based on, on projects that the Conference of Mayors were seeing with their members. Uh, and then we applied them to specific text, uh, uh, specific case studies. One of the first ones is the investment tax credit for energy properties. And that's kind of a broad term, but it's a it's a systems idea for energy improvements uh, in uh, at your uh, in your as part of your infrastructure and at your facilities. Uh, it uh, includes things like uh, like microgrids uh, and advanced controls, uh, and we'll see that example in one of the in one of the case studies. Uh, but also just straightforward on the clean electricity uh, invest, investment tax credits for the installation uh, of renewable energy projects that a number of communities have uh, have advanced throughout uh, throughout the years. Uh, and then finally, one that's uh, that's uh, front of mind for many communities uh, and fleet operators is around uh, around commercial vehicles uh, transition to electric vehicles uh, and the supporting infrastructure that's necessary to uh, to keep them running. Let's go to the next slide, please. 
the while the amounts may vary as to what the taxes uh, tax credits can be, they can have a really significant impact uh, on the financial pro forma for the investments that you seek to make. It's everything from uh, percent reduction in overall cost of project to long-term payments uh, for the production of energy to straight out rebates uh, for the purchase of uh, pur purchase of electric uh, electric vehicles. Uh, it's important that uh, you understand the you understand the specific dollar amounts that are available, how they're going to be paid out over time, uh, and work with your finance department departments, budget uh, offices, and city managers uh, to structure uh, structure transactions that work for you. It's also important to note that uh, the federal government has a significant interest in making these programs successful uh, and are willing to work with you as they develop, uh, develop interpretations of rules and regulations. But ultimately, uh, it's something that you with your municipal staffs uh, need to structure and work on, similar to the way you would put together any bond transaction uh, in your community. Let's go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> the uh, a few things, a few things to note. Uh, like any federal program, particularly any federal program through the IRS, there are a lot of rules, and you have to follow the rules uh, closely. Uh, and a lot of it needs to be taken into account when you're planning your projects. Uh, the availability of the credits based on the timing of your of your projects uh, is a real concern that you have to focus on. You need to be attentive to the fact that some of the credits are phased out over time, particularly related to the production of clean energy. And then probably the most uh, the most important point in understanding how the credits work. Uh, for the investment tax credit, you receive it as a lump sum once the project is placed into service. What does that mean? That means that uh, the community will need to advance the investment uh, and receive its money uh, money at the end. Uh, depending on the sources of, uh, of federal or state dollars, you may be used to that model. Uh, in other instances, you may uh, see the need for upfront dollars uh, to make a project work. Uh, there is the ability to stack and use multiple uh, sources of funds, but there are also some limitations that we'll talk about in a, a little later uh, as to what you can and uh, can and can't do. Uh, and finally, since um, many or most municipalities use tax exempt financing uh, for their work, and that tax exemption is related to uh, federal tax liability, uh, there is a uh, there is the need to consider the the benefits of tax exempt financing and recognize that if you're using tax exempt financing, that the overall amount of credits uh, through the Inflation Reduction Act can be reduced. Let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, one of the things that I think is particularly uh, exciting for for communities, uh, particularly since local governments for for so long have been focusing their sustainability efforts not just on um, having a greener planet, but by building uh, healthier and more prosperous and equitable communities. Uh, and these tax credits really allow you to plan your projects well for the greatest local impact. Uh, and by uh, increasing uh, local impact, uh, you can significantly increase or, or achieve bonus amounts uh, that significantly uh, increase the value of the, of the overall program. It's everything from uh, prevailing wage and apprenticeship programs because of the job opportunities created from these uh, investments to uh, focus on domestic uh, content, but also an emphasis uh, on, uh, on where sites are located uh, with a particular preference towards energy communities. So if uh, in, the, uh, in the state of Illinois, a number of communities formerly had uh, coal fire power plants that have been closed down. If you have one of those in your community uh, or you're adjacent to it, uh, there's a, a tax benefit, uh, additional benefit by focusing your investment there. Uh, similarly, uh, lower income communities can also benefit significantly. And many communities are already thinking about those investments, uh, but your planning departments uh, have, been, have been working through community development uh, transactions for a long time, thinking about how to drive social impact with your uh, investment and infrastructure decisions. Uh, and this program through the IRA really plays to your strengths. Let's go to the next one, please. 
I think the other one of the other exciting things uh, before the Inflation Reduction Act, there was the uh, the uh, the IIJA, so the Infrastructure uh, Infrastructure Bill. Uh, there are a host of different uh, grants, loans, and incentives at the federal uh, and uh, state level. Uh, the state of Illinois, for example, has one of the most aggressive uh, energy programs, uh, clean energy transition programs uh, in the United States. And as you'll see in at least a couple of the case studies that we're going to talk about, these dollars can be combined to really advance your overall program. Let's go to the next slide. All right, so let's talk specifically about the case studies. Uh, we've had the, the privilege of working with the Conference of Mayors and CE2AS over the last several years, focusing on a model uh, that cities have always, uh, have always done well with, and that's case studies, uh, where we look at specific activities that cities have done and show how, uh, how we can learn from each other and implement those programs. Because at the time we did the study, the Inflation Reduction Act was, was brand new, you know, had recently been passed. Uh, we went back and looked at existing projects that had been uh, advanced. And we kind of asked the question of, you know, what if, what if the Inflation Reduction Act had been in place uh, when these projects were, were in the planning stages or moving forward to see what kind of impact would, uh, would happen? And we focused on th three real world examples that were tied back to those those three areas that we thought made the most uh, made the most sense for communities. Uh, one, the the energy systems or energy projects. One focusing on a microgrid or a wastewater treatment plant. Uh, then, uh, our sorry, uh, uh, campus wide microgrid with the use of solar to add to a uh, add to a district energy system that is built and running in the city of Denver. The second one was focused on a wastewater treatment plant and the addition of a microgrid, a carbon-free microgrid, to increase the resilience of that wastewater treatment plant, uh, as well as to create uh, opportunities to invest and modernize, modernize the infrastructure. Uh, and then finally, a specific case study uh, on fleet, uh, fleet decarbonization uh, and comparing the economics of both the infrastructure and the fleet uh, conversion uh, with and without the IRA. So let's go to the, the next slide and let's talk specifically uh, about it. We're going to start with, uh, with the fleet one, because that's, again, as I pointed out, that one is probably uh, top of mind for, for, most, uh, for most communities. Uh, it's advanced by the incentives that are available already from the state of Illinois uh, and the encouragement of, of utilities uh, throughout the state. So let's uh, look at this next slide, please. Uh, we took a project, and this is a uh, municipal planned municipal fleet conversion. Uh, in in Michigan, where there was a desire to uh, convert over 100, 100 passenger vehicles, uh, and as is essential to develop the uh, develop the uh, charging infrastructure uh, to to support that, uh, the the graph uh, on the on the left uh, or sorry on the right side of the the slide really shows the difference. And what, what's the bottom line? And the bottom line is that this project using the IRA generated uh, about $640,000 or $40, worth of additional investment and, uh, from the federal government uh, and significantly reduced the payback period uh, uh, by two years. Uh, so it's the kind of thing that if, if you've got a project that is on the fence uh, and you're trying to get it to pencil out, uh, these dollars can make a really, really significant difference. Let's go to the next one, please. All right, let's talk about the, the wastewater, wastewater treatment plan. One of the reasons we focused in on, uh, on wastewater uh, and water generally is that it, uh, for communities across the United States, the cost of water, uh, pumping it, cleaning it, delivering it to people, uh, and uh, then taking back the dirty water and cleaning up uh, usually constitutes one of, if not the largest energy bill uh, for communities. Uh, at the same time, many municipalities are dealing with infrastructure that's supported by uh, ratepayer dollars uh, that they have to uh, that they have to maintain, and oftentimes uh, fall behind on maintaining them. Uh, this is a project that is located in California, uh, where there is a, a wastewater treatment plant that sought to increase its resilience and take advantage uh, of, uh, of some of the energy opportunities uh, and market participation opportunities that exist within that state. Uh, it's also a uh, facility that had a significant uh, 
cost uh, of, uh, of upgrade of essential systems, upgrade of things like its bio cell, its treatment systems, uh, upgrade of the, uh, the basic electric infrastructure, uh, the need to uh, demo portions of the site and clean up brownfields. Ultimately, they had about a $70 million must spend with uh, on the uh, on the ratepayers dime uh, deferred liability that was coming due. One of the things that they realized though was by being energy focusing on the energy elements on increasing resilience and, and reducing carbon, uh, they could bring in significant uh, benefits. And the the interesting thing is a uh, hundred million dollar project, seventy million dollars of work that had to be done anyway with the use of the tax credits. Uh, could bring the total cost and by stacking in some of the other dollars like uh, like energy savings and state rebates could bring the total cost down to forty eight million dollars. What does that mean bottom line? It means a significant impact uh, to the community in terms of reducing emissions, uh, improving uh, improving resilience of critical infrastructure, uh, but also it means a significant reduction uh, in what ratepayers are going to have to spend. Let's go to the next one, please. So what are the kind of what are the what are the lessons learned from uh, from all of this? Uh, it's a new program and a new opportunity that communities haven't been able to uh, access before. Uh, but it's something that's going to take some time, and we think that works well with what communities are good at. Uh, and what are some of those ideas? Uh, thinking about uh, project locations and project uh, impacts so that you can maximize the credits that are available to you. Uh, being really intentional, uh, besides thinking about timing, being really intentional about how you structure the transactions uh, and structure procurements. Uh, because this is new for cities, but it's also gonna be new uh, for some of the vendors and contractors that you work with. So if you have, if from your analysis, you conclude you want to do a project and you have certain compliance obligations within the program, apprenticeship programs, for example, you need to make sure that those exist within your procurement documents so that uh, you get proposals that are compliant uh, and help you comply with the tax, uh, tax opportunities. Uh, the availability, the ability to stack dollars and compare and contrast dollars and choose options of what's best for you from uh, uh, interest-free uh, financing, uh, interest-free debt to specific access to the tax credits uh, is something that needs to be uh, considered. Uh, and the reality is, as, you, as most municipalities deal with in any financing, uh, probably need some outside support uh, and help. And so that means working closely with your financial advisors, uh, working closely with, with tax, uh, tax council, uh, and then making sure that your finance department, your city manager's offices are tracking what the IRS uh, is doing in terms of guidance. They are moving as quickly as the federal government moves uh, to make the dollars available, but it is um, evolving as, uh, as we speak and will continue to for the next, the next few years. And with that, uh, I appreciate the opportunity and we'll move on to a really cool example. So, uh, hi everybody, I'm Mike Gleason. Um, one of the things that uh, the mayor talked about at the, at the top of the program is that I was the co-lead for the state and local fiscal recovery funds. Every city under that program uh, got a grant of some dollar amount uh, to help with uh, COVID related expenses. Um, the, the team sort of had two different parts to it. One was, uh, you know, keeping up with treasury and the other part that I, uh, worked on, uh, really closely was the compliance side, making sure that cities, once they got those dollars, uh, met their needs. And a lot of, out of that, uh, we saw the, uh, the need for human capacity. And that's sort of what I'm going to talk about here today. Uh, you know, three years into this program and uh, working with almost all the states, uh, talking about, uh, you know, what do cities need at a very simple level to execute the direct pay program to make sure that they cap, you know, that they're doing this in the, the best way possible. So um, to claim these credits, cities need human capacity. That's just the, the basic thing. First of all, they need 
people who are not working at 100% LOE, which is level of effort, they have to have some capacity in their job to take on new responsibilities. Uh, as Bill was saying, you know, they have to follow uh, IRS guidance. So you're either going to need to find someone who has LOE available or can create LOE or for some other other way to get LOE in your office, which could possibly be through hiring other people. And uh, they also need expertise to claim these credits. And we'll sort of go into that in the next uh, slide, but not right now, please don't change the slide, about what these expertise will mean. And what I'm gonna do is, uh, one of the things that the National League of Cities has seen is that the lowest hanging flute the lowest hanging fruit is a clean commercial vehicles um, uh, program. So we're going to look at this today in just two aspects of this and say, like, you know, how do you develop the expertise to do the basics of this? Because this is one of the easier ones to do. My goal today, and I will say this very clearly, is to not scare anybody away. As all three previous speakers have said, this is transformative. This gets us towards the goals that we're trying to achieve. But there is, uh, you know, things in here that need expertise and LOE and capacity and making sure that you have that in your city it will be critical. So, uh, as I said, today we'll be talking about clean commercial vehicles, Section 45W, a couple of its elements and who you need on your staff in order to take advantage of it. Next slide, please. So, first, um, uh, one of the things the that is typically talked about is how much a city can claim for putting a clean commercial vehicle into service. Now, the typical answer is $7,500 for a light truck and $40,000 for larger vehicles. But that isn't exactly right because once you get your tax form, you're gonna need to put down a specific dollar. You can't just say 7,500 or 40,000. There's gotta be a specific dollar amount. And the tax code specifies a formula to get a city or any other eligible entity to how much they can claim on that tax form. And it's laid out below. It's 15% of the basis of such vehicle, 30% of the basis in the case of a vehicle not powered by gasoline or diesel internal combustion engine, or an incremental cost of such vehicle. Well, what, like, let's take a look, because you have it's an or test, and it's the lesser of. Uh, which I did not put in here. So first of all, you have to have someone on your staff who can figure out the basis of the vehicle. And then you have to do the incremental cost. So you have to do an analysis of a similar, a similarly situated vehicle. So like, you know, what are the elements of that similarly situated vehicle? You know, how much time is it going to take to go out and, you know, analyze that? You know, these are the things that, again, speak to LOE and making sure you have the capacity. So you have to have the, the capacity to do the, the tax work. You have to have the level of effort, time to be able to do the incremental cost, all to get you to step one, which is how much you can claim on your LOE is level of effort. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, Liz. Uh, level of effort is the amount of the time. If you're working at 100%, for, for example, um, then you have no excess LOE. If you're working at 50% capacity, then you have 50% more LOE that you can you can expend to get to your thing. It's a, a bookkeeping uh, 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 term. And do your staff members, can they calculate basis and do they know how to do the comparison? Like this is the sort of the thing as you sort of think about this, like do you have the right people on staff and you know do they have the, abil the ability and time to get, to get you even to figure out this number so you can claim this credit. Uh, next slide, please. So limitation on manufacturers. This is a possible foot fault. And I think this is something that a lot of cities will run into here. So right after this in the code section, came, right after the, this code section came out, a city came to NLC and they wanted to buy a fire truck for a million and four from a certain manufacturer. But can you buy it from any electrical vehicle manufacturer? And the answer is no. There is an IRS approved vendors list that says that says you can buy it and get the tax credit, or you can not if you buy it from this person who is not on the approved tax credit, you can't get it. So again, like really being able to dig in because it says 
you know, this particular code section and it references back to uh, a cross section in the code. Again, you have to have the knowledge internally to be able to read this code and make sure you don't make this footfall because if you buy from the wrong vendor, no, no credit, no $40,000 potentially. So that's a, a, you know, something to keep in mind. Uh, next slide, please. So where does this all lead? Uh, one, here's what you need. You need to make, find someone who can read the tax code comfortably. And the point is because mistakes can be made and they can be costly for your city. There are other issues with direct pay that can lead to costly mistakes, but like, you know, just being able to figure out, you know, how to calculate um, uh, the amount that you're going to put down as your credit or the amount that your, you know, which vehicles qualify from which, which vendors I think is important. Uh, you need someone in your city finance office who can, for example, calculate percent of basis if you're going to take advantage of this credit. Can your current finance staff do this? I think that's a question that you need to ask and try to figure out. Um, you know, tax is not something that many cities are fluent in. Uh, 5,000 cities in America do not have a full-time staffer in their finance office. So, uh, you know, making sure that you have someone who can do this and do it right is important. Uh, you need a city attorney who can verify that the statute is being interpreted correctly and nothing is missed. Um, if you read, you know, again, this is very technical. It really takes uh, time. And again, mistakes can be costly. Um, if you want to pursue elective pay, you know, and you don't have the expertise, like that's fine. Like we all want to get to the goal of doing these projects. Uh, and if you don't have the expertise in law or tax in house, outside assistance is totally fine. There are a lot of outside counsels, a lot of assistants who can help you. So people, there, there is assistance if you, if you need assistance. And finally, the message that I want to leave you with is this is a transformative program but it has to be done carefully. Uh, so your city isn't audited and there are no penalties. Uh, next slide. So for cities that are gonna focus, um, I think the big thing is focus on the achievable based on your resources, based on your internal capacity, and based on the resources that you have internally and what you can, you know, the, the outside help that you need to acquire. Uh, once you figure out the project or projects that you wanna pursue, determine how the capacity and then go forward. Again, please do not think of this as an impediment, but think of this as sort of making sure that you have your ducks in a row to go forward. And pre-register, uh, pre-registration for the portal is now open. Cities can register their project with the IRS, which is the first step to claiming the credit. Thank you. Oh, and uh, this is, uh, we have, these are the resources um, that, uh, NLC has, so, and uh, U.S. Conference of Mayors and ACOM, uh, so, um, and there you go. There's our information if you'd like to get in touch. I think that list of resources answers a lot of questions we got on the chat. And, of course, this session is being recorded, so we'll have that. Well, Mike, uh, I think you began your comments with, I don't want to scare anybody, but I just want you to know that 75 people dropped off the call the moment you started speaking. So thank you for thank that. You. Thank you, sir. Welcome to NLC. <laughs> <laughs> we have a, a 10 minute period for q and I'm going to ask my colleagues, Cheryl and Edith to kind of monitor that. And then we'll jump sure. into our next speaker. And I don't want to say I was scared, but um, there it does look complicated. Uh, so thank you for kind of laying that out. And uh, I was yeah, quick. Mike, if you could just share your cell phone with all of us so that if we have any questions. <laughs> well, well, I was I... wondering what training and support there might be for the finance officers, but you can stew on that question a little bit. Let me get to the, um, that's my question. Let me get to the questions in the chat. Um, and if we could, a uh, question from Tom Maylard in Waukegan, if you want to ask that directly, or um, I will ask it for you. It's a good question in the chat about yeah, energy it, it communities. Looks, it looks like some folks are able to help that, but we were just trying to confirm uh, he was referencing tax credits available for communities with coal plants. We've had a recent coal plant closure. Granted, the peaker units are still burning. And so there was a question if that's also considered eligible. It should be that it's focused on the, the coal plant, uh, the, the use of the coal. So you should be fine. Perfect. But, and, and but, but as it, map in there, so thank you. 
Yeah, but as pointed out by the last speaker, make sure you check with your your tax council. But yes, that's uh, yeah, a lot of the the old coal plants still have some some strong infrastructure available for energy production. But just have to uh, double check it with your council. Thank you. A question from Sarah Hinshaw um, of Kane County about manufacturer requirements across all tax credits, and that may be something that we'll hear from Joey uh, if if this group can't answer that. But is the manufacturer requirement across all tax credits, i.e., replacing Windows and HVAC? You didn't actually finish the question, Sarah, but <laughs> I think I know what you're no, getting at there. It's like the, the uh, cl clean commercial vehicles does not have a uh, domestic content. Domestic content applies to the vehicle manufacturers. Uh, domestic content applies to many of them, but not to all of them. And yeah. then, yeah, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, there's actually, there was a, a table in the slides uh, the, uh, that showed the bonus opportunities and requirements, including domestic content. You can just look at that, uh, just made, made the point, right? Thank you. Larson, Wheaton Sanitary District has both a question in the chat and his uh, hand up. Go ahead, Matt. Uh, thank you, Edith. It's the same topic. Um, hopefully this applies to other people, but I, I wanted to ask a, a specific question about uh, what constitutes project construction and starting. Uh, we're looking at putting in a solar installation and uh, if there's a certain domestic content, uh, obviously you get a larger rebate. Uh, that domestic content value, though, changes each year moving forward. So, for instance, uh, if it's a multi-year project, uh, what constitutes when the project begins to lock in that domestic content percentage? Or said differently, if we were three -year, a two-year project um, and uh, some work will be done in 2024 and some will be done in 2025, and if the domestic content um, increases from 2024 to 2025, um, how do you lock in that 2024 domestic content level? What level of construction needs to be started? Does anybody have any feel for that? I'll look it up and get back to you. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, it, look, it's a great question. You know, we're, we're in the middle of commenting on domestic content waivers right now. Um, so I just, you know, one of the things is, it, you know, and Bill alluded to this, like work with your tax council. It's not just section 6417, which is the direct pay or the other sections that sort of marry with that. But then there's all this guidance that's out there. There's like 1800 pages of guidance that you have to go through. And, you know, I, I just have to go back and take a look at uh, domestic content. Yeah, my experts have told me that as long as you have any construction started in 2024, you lock in that domestic content criteria. But I just want to confirm that because that's a very important uh, criteria. Um, and um, yeah, I would love it if you could look into that, Mike, and, and get back to us. That'd be very helpful. Sure. Uh, Mark Pruitt's question just because it was related um, to Matt's about the clarifying whether the incentives are available to communities prior uh, to, during, or after project deployment. So the timing question again. Sure. Yeah, no problem. Mark, was that, did I, I just read your question. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, pretty much it. It's just that I've worked with some communities who initially looked at this funding and thought, oh, well, great. We'll be able to use this money to pay for our pre-development work. And it, it turned out in their case, you're still gonna have a ramp up in cost and you're gonna have to fund uh, pre-development, particularly for solar projects. So I just wanted to to see if there was any any sense of, um, you know, whether the, the timing and availability of the incentives was going to change. So Mark, is there a, can I just clarify, is that a, is that a cash flow concern or the eligibility of development costs, you know, pre-development costs for, for coverage yeah, before I we, think we turn it over to Mike to answer? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that's, that's completely fair. Um, the communities I was observing going through this process 
uh, really were dealing with a cash flow issue. And, and it was able to be solved through a procurement method where the where the developer was going to pick up those interconnection study costs and, and, and other types of costs. But it was something of, um, I, I don't know who was advising them early on, but they were under the impression that, oh, well, we just apply, we get the cash, and then we'll spend the cash on the project. And it's, it's not that way. You you need to develop the project, deploy the project, prove uh, qualification, and then receive uh, almost on a reimbursement schedule. And I just wanted to make sure that my limited experience was reflective of the, of the general structure. You got it almost 100% right. So sweet. You have you have to you have to front the the pre development costs, and you know for solar that can be expensive. Um, you know a any of these things it can be expensive, and you know for a city with a municipal budget that's you know have it, it, the, that could be tight. Fine, that that's something that has to be done. This is uh, these tax credits you file with the IRS. They pay you back after the project is placed in service, which is a term of art in tax. So once it's placed in service, then you file your return, then you get your money back. So it mm -hmm. is. It, I can understand your cash flow issue. Like, yeah, the upfront cost could be, you know, significant, and um, you know, it's only once you you get this, then you get the money back. Great. Thanks for that confirmation. But it is, Mark, an opportunity, though, and, and uh, I know it's been raised by a number of the state energy offices around around the country about the use of other funds to help pre pre pay for some of that advanced, uh, advanced planning. So I, I think you also want to have that entity look at other sources like the Energy Conservation Block Grant and uh, to help deal with some of those cash flow problems and prep. We have time for one more question, I think, if we want to stay on schedule. Edith? Sure. Okay, we might come back to them if uh, other speakers wrap up uh, sooner. But um, Tim Milburn has a question. There's some specific questions. Actually, I want to take two if we could, Kevin. A um, okay. question about stacking. Uh, uh, and it's, I'll read it from the chat. But what kinds of PPP programs can be applied to maximize the leveraging of incentives? For example, could a municipality participate in a NEVI or a CFI program? Those are charging infrastructure program to fill the 20% of the initial investment not covered by the NEVI program. Bill, this is it's kind of what you're getting at on your slides, but uh, you. Yeah, I mean, you have to look at them program by program. We will get back to Edith with the specifics on, on NEVI, but uh, you generally should be able to, uh, to stack certain types of grants and incentives, utility incentives, infrastructure dollars uh, to support uh, to support the program, but you have to look at it on a source by source and a source by source basis. I ask that in particular because a lot of the disadvantaged communities on the corridors are struggling to make an investment case under NEVI or CFI. And if they could have some other means of filling in those gaps, uh, it would be great. So, yeah, we can, uh, we'd be happy to follow up uh, with you with a, sp a specific response on how. Uh, how those programs tie together, uh, and we'll we'll provide that through uh, through Cassidy to Edith. Thank you. That work. And last question um, before next speaker. So I'm going to paraphrase Lisa Sansenbacher's from Skokie's uh, question, and that's about getting information to the finance team. But I'm wondering um, from the NLC US Conference of Mayors. AECOM team, what um, are there any trainings offered to government finance officers specifically um, that we should be pointing to? Because a lot of the team here, um, or a lot of the members on the call today, um, are administrative sustainability elected officials. Um, we probably have some finance staff, but where should we be? Uh, wh where should we be pointing the finance folks to for training? Carolyn, do you want to talk about the boot camp? Ooh. I like the sound of that. Oh, sure. Yeah, I thought you were going to say um, GFOA, but um, I'm not yeah, you know, we're, <laughs> we're, we are happy to uh, be a connection for any of the uh, city staff, um, you know, whether finance officer or sustainability, um, and also through a partner, Government Finance Officers Association. But through the local infrastructure hub, which I think was one of the links on the resources slide, um, we are offering a boot camp uh, that is actually ongoing right now. 
uh, that would help local governments kind of go through these processes, these these early steps right now to get kind of your ducks in a row um, to take advantage of the direct pay. So the website is generally um, localinfrastructure.org and uh, you'll see the follow it down uh, for the boot camp sign up. Thank I you. put the um, link to that, but I would also great. point to the local infrastructure hub. Great. And uh, just uh, Cheryl does an excellent job of organizing all of this on the Environment Committee webpage. She already put the link in the chat. And once we get all these, um, we get the recording and the slides and uh, helpful links up after the meeting. Very good. In reverse order of our presentations and our presenters, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Cassidy. And thank you, Carolyn. Our next speaker is Jared Palachikio, who is the Deputy Chief Sustainability Officer and Deputy Commissioner for the recently reborn Department of Environment in the city of Chicago. Jared works on complex environmental policies and programs in Chicago, including EV infrastructure, solar energy procurement, and utility policies, and Jared contributed to the 2022 Chicago Climate Action Plan. Jared graduated from this relatively new school called the Harvard Law School and Franklin and Marshall College in beautiful Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Jared, the floor is yours, sir. We look forward to your presentation. Thanks, Mayor Burns. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm only going to talk for a couple minutes, um, and I'll actually try and keep it brief so that folks can just... Um... You win the award for the greatest presenter of all time. Thank you. Yeah. So, so yes, uh, I only have one slide. I only have one slide. Hopefully that wins an award. Um, basically, my purpose is not to go through, you, you know, in depth like um, uh, like Bill and and, and the uh, the NLC folks did. I just want to share what Chicago is doing on direct pay. Um, so basically, if all goes as planned, Chicago will um, will receive direct pay cash payments from the IRS this year. Uh, you know, we've jokingly said we should do like a, a publisher's clearinghouse type, uh, you know, event with a giant with a giant check. Um, we'll we'll see though. We're, we don't have it in hand yet. Um, so, on the left hand side of, and I think I should be sharing. Um, uh, on the left hand side of the screen, um, I'm just going to walk through what we're doing, and then on the right hand side, um, I'm going to walk through things we're thinking about. We definitely don't have this. 100% um, figured out, but I think we feel that we're confident enough we can get going on this. And our goal really is to kind of test the waters with what we're kind of calling bread and butter sort of projects, projects that aren't super complex, um, that we think um, are are suitable for navigating this process so that down the road we can build in more complexity and um and and really strategically use this this opportunity um and, and i'll just also say before i get into the details we are quite excited about this we think that once this is running in a more i don't want to say it's not smooth now but once people have gotten the hang of it how about that um you know this is um not competitive <laughs> So we don't have to navigate, you, you know, the vagaries of whether or not a federal agency will award this to us. Um, it is not capped uh, as of right now, and it runs for ten years. And so that's that's quite a, an amazing combination in our in our view. And that's um, I think I think Edith saw me um, at a at another conference of appearing very excited about it and say, "You got to talk about your excitement about this." So here we are. Um, so what are we what are we going to attempt to do this year? We have, I think one of the things I want to communicate is I think it can get overwhelming because you see this like long list of tax credits, right? And, and you're like, oh my God, how do I even pick? Well, at least from our perspective, and I think this is going to be the same for all of you all, I don't think anybody in our region is attempting incredibly complex carbon capture and sequestration projects at the moment, at least. You're really looking at a couple of the tax credits. You're talking about the the... EV per EVs, the EV charging, and and then probably solar, right? Um, 
most for most of us, that's what we're looking at. That's what Chicago's looking at also. On the right-hand side, if I have time, I'll quickly mention one other one that maybe shows up down the road. Um, so for EVs, that's the one that we're kind of using as our test case. We purchased electric vehicles last year and put them into service. We purchased charging infrastructure that in many cases is, is in the census tracts that qualify for it. And those are the the things that we did in 2023 that we are going to now navigate the register the pre-registration process and then the form process the filing of the form in, in later this year um we also have some ongoing projects related to um uh solar deployment on built city building rooftops um in in um uh chicago neighborhoods Basically, the long and short of that is those projects are very much ongoing, but we just didn't get the solar up and installed in, in, in service this year. So um, those will be um, almost certainly 2025 filings for us. Um, there there are, are other test cases. They're just not going to be ready uh, to file the forms with the IRS this year. Um, so those are the two, those are the two um, things we're working on here. And um, I'm, you know, again, I'm not going to repeat everything that was said about the mechanics, although I'm happy to answer questions about our experience. Although, like I say on my slide, I am not do not, you know, do not go back to your to your respective communities and say that the city of Chicago gave you uh, give you tax advice. Uh, we did not give you tax advice <laughs> just to just to make that clear. Um, those are the two bread and butter things. We hope to have cash for the EVs and the um, the EV charging. Uh, later this year. Uh, we are aware of the haircut for uh, tax exempt bonds. These are all being paid for with tax exempt bonds, capital spending. So, you know, overall is that um, do we, we just sort of accept that there's there's a, a haircut for the tax exempt bonds. Um, we feel confident that that doesn't change our eligibility. We got advice from bond council uh, through our law department that you know, you just have to take the haircut of, I think it's is a 15%. Somebody can check me on the exact number. Um, just a couple other things. And again, I, I don't want to keep going because uh, I want to allow time for questions. We definitely see this as a way to build community wealth and um, and opportunity for Chicago nonprofits and, and, faith, and faith institutions. I have pending because we haven't launched a formal program to assist uh, our, our our NGOs and, and CBOs and, and faith institutions, but our attempt to navigate this process now is designed to, to allow us to be able to partner with others eligible for direct pay down the road and, and in order to seize this opportunity. Um, you, you know, obviously this is um, designed to help us meet our climate action plan goal. And then, um, and then as others were saying in the questions, we certainly still need to figure out a strategy for bridge capital or revolving or revolving funds. Um, you know, we were lucky in that we already had capital um, capital allocations through our capital program for the projects that are going into service. But if we really want to make this impactful, um, we certainly have work to do to develop an internal strategy. Um, uh, you know, utilizing bridge capital, revolving funds, and excited to hear about some of the things that. Um, the Illinois Climate Bank is working on. On the right-hand side, just a couple other things that you're probably thinking about. We definitely had to figure out who had authority to file these uh, forms and then receive the payments. Um, you, you know, up till now, nobody's obviously been filing with the IRS. Um, for what it's worth, I mean, obviously it's going to depend on each each community, but we've figure that out and somebody we feel pretty good somebody has existing authority to do that at the city, a city officer. Um already talked about bridge capital for us and revolving funds for us being something to keep this going internally and have momentum internally. We want to figure out the same thing for, for this, the community. Um, also thinking like the questions, like Tim's question, how does this stack with other funding sources? There's certainly lots of questions that pop up on the ground once you dig into it and agree with Bill that it's something that's going to take kind of you know, case by case um, work. We're even realizing we have to think about this for grants that we give out. So for example, we have a climate infrastructure grant program where we give micro grants to small businesses and nonprofits for things like EVs and solar. And we've had to figure, think through how does that, how does that um, interact with a church that decides to file for direct pay? So certainly a lot to think about there. 
literally as we sit here in February, navigating the pre-registration system is, it, it hasn't been challenging, but it's just been something that's taken time. Um, and we still haven't actually filed the pre-registration. That's our, our goal is over the next few weeks to, to do that. I previewed that there's maybe one other credit that we at least are thinking about, and that's geothermal. Um, we have a, a group that many of you may be familiar with named Blacks and Green um, here in Chicago and in, in the Woodlawn neighborhood in Chicago. They received funding from the U.S. Department of Energy for a community geothermal pilot. The city's a partner of that effort. Um, I think we're very interested in geothermal as a, as a potential decarbonization, building decarbonization strategy. So I could see down the road, maybe looking at the geothermal credit. But for the time being, we're really focused on what I've called bread and butter, which is EVs, EV chargers, and uh, and solar. And um, oh, one last thing, and then I and then I'm done. And happy to answer questions if we have time. Um, we were successful in getting one of our solar installations on a branch library approved for the low income bonus. So we we also now have sort of a track record of navigating that process. So we applied in October um, through the US Department of Energy. Confusingly, they're administering the low income bonus allocations, um, but we applied and then we're told not that long ago, only I think a month ago that, um, uh, that we had been accepted or given an allocation for one of the um, rooftop solar installations. So that's exciting. Um, again, we haven't actually deployed that. So I can't tell you how the process went of actually filing for the bonus. We just have the allocation set aside for us. Um, I know that was a kind of a hodgepodge, but you've obviously been listening to a, you know, an overview of this for the last hour. So I I'll stop there. And if there's time, I am um, more than happy to answer questions about our experience so far. Thank you, Jared. And uh, your enthusiasm is contagious. Everybody on the this call has been excited about this. So I just wanted to get you with other folks that were equally as excited. And then, of course, we had really strong attendance uh, for people that are excited. I'm not seeing any um, specific questions Oh, Matt Larson, go ahead. Uh, uh, Wheaton Sanitary District. Uh, it's maybe not a question, but if could you talk a little more about navigating the pre-registration system? I'm assuming that means if you're going to be applying for these credits, um, you have to uh, basically apply ahead of time. But could you provide a little more details on, on what you guys have done? And you said it's not overly challenging, just takes time, but we'd definitely like some more details on when does that process need to start, kind of, who who should be doing it and things like, like that? Yeah, sure. Thanks for the question. Um, it hasn't been um, super, there's nothing super eventful to report so far. One thing they're doing this year is they are giving, so normally these forms, I'm, sh I'm sure this was covered in the overall presentation. Normally these forms are due May 15th each year. Um, you can request an extension. This year, they are giving governments an automatic six-month extension once you, I guess, click apply or whatever on the pre-registration, pre you'll, you'll then automatically get six months because the, it's a little unclear to us whether this is mandatory or just, um, just a, like a, a prudent uh, thing, but the IRS is saying they want you pre-registered or, or like a going through the process of the pre-registration 120 days before you, I think it's 120. Again, don't quote me on that. It could potentially be 90, but it's either 90 or 120 days before you file your forms. And so, you know, sitting here February 20th, that's, we're already obviously past, um, I think both though, even if I'm wrong about the 120 and it's 90, we're past those num that number of days before May 15th. So I probably for reasons like that, they're automatically granting six months um, extension uh, to, to when the form is due. We're obviously going to we're going to try not to burn through all six months because, you know, the longer you wait to file, the longer it takes for you to get your cash payment. But um, it's good to know that we're not under the, you know, we're not jammed up having to having to have it all done by May. Other than that, um, it's, you know, it's a, there's a register, there's, um, you have to have a login.gov um, registration, I believe. And um, we haven't decided who literally is going to do it. Um, I don't think it has to be anybody in particular. On our end, we had to figure out who has authority from the city of Chicago to, to, you know, like in our code to, to file something with the feds. But I, I don't recall seeing anything so far that a particular, 
person has to do it on their end. So you don't have to register before you start the project. This is just more the registration to be eligible to get the credits. Correct. Yeah, this is registration. Uh, I think honestly, I mean, others that are, you know, from the national folks that are more expert on this, I believe this is designed to weed out fraud. It's to make sure that the entities that are going to ultimately be filing forms are, you know, either NGOs or, or governments. I think that that's the purpose of this step. Thank you, Jared. Um, any other questions? I'm not seeing more in the chat specific uh, for the city of Chicago. Um, but I, I do have a thought and that this is, I guess, generally to all of the speakers. So it, it's great seeing that Chicago's pioneering this and I wanna see your giant um, clearinghouse check presentation <laughs> celebration. That sounds really fun uh, for a success for doing this. But you know, the, the um, mayor's caucus is 274 municipalities that are not Chicago. And I'm wondering if there's any gap here in terms of assistance or service where we could do some transfer. Is there a need for um, training education? Is there anything we can do collaboratively? And I'm actually going to um, direct that question to Bill Abelt, who knows both the city of Chicago and collaborations really well. So that's just a general think about it uh, question. Should, should somebody here be doing something to bring this information and resources collaboratively to the rest of the membership? It's a great question. And one one little thing I forgot to mention that might be worth conversation um, um, with, with these groups is, one thing that's helping us out is we were accepted into a program being funded by Bloomberg Philanthropies. It's a joint program of World Resources Institute, um, Government Finance Officers Association, and a third group called Lawyers for Good Government. I'll be perfectly honest. I mean, we were accepted because we're a really big city and they want um, it, it. So it's got a little bit of a corny name. It's called the Lighthouse Cohort. I, it's, you know, it's designed to prove up the concept to get some big cities doing this. Um, but uh, I think certainly it'd be worth um, exploring whether they could, you know, whether there are opportunities to have broader training beyond, um, you know, just big cities, obviously. Mm -hmm. That'd be great. I'm, I'm glad to hear that that uh, the, the leadership and support is there and that the NLC has the boot camp. I guess Conference of Mayors has, I guess NLC has the boot camp. Uh, so it sounds like it's coming, but just speaking on behalf of the uh, membership, just keep us in mind if we can do some things collaboratively uh, to help some of the smaller communities, that'd be really cool. Because we do a collaborative procurement, right? So we could do some things here uh, for potentially on this project too. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jared. Exciting to see what you're pioneering. Um, and thanks to everybody. Mayor Burns had to go to another meeting. Um, so I will introduce our next speaker just to clo uh, close out the um, the discussion on IRA. And so we've got a uh, conversation and focusing a little bit on what uh, Carolyn introduced um, in the beginning. And this has to do with uh, uh, consumer facing uh, rebates and uh, pleased to welcome Joey Lee uh, from the Citizens Utility Board um, to, to close out the presentation. Uh, Joey builds uh, grassroots support for building decarbonization as the carbon free uh, buildings coordinator at the Citizens Utility Board, affectionately known as CUB. Uh, she works to engage residents and develop accessible tools and resources to demystify uh, decarbonization. And uh, please uh, welcome Joey Lee. Hi, good morning. Um, thank you, Edith, for that introduction. Again, my name is Joey. I'm from the Citizens Utility Board, or CUB. CUB is a utility watchdog nonprofit that advocates for affordable and sustainable energy policies here in Illinois. We've been around since 1984, fighting utility rate hikes, providing consumer education, and helping folks with really urgent utility needs. And at CUB, we've been um, thinking a lot about how to in ensure that this information gets to low and moderate income families to make sure that our transition off of gas is equitable. So I'm really excited to be here and speaking to all of you today. Um, so when we're talking about rebates for our consumers, a lot of that is going to be changes that are made inside of the home, right? So those largely come in two groups, in tax credits and in rebates. 
the tax credits are in green, rebates are in blue, and tax credits are incentives that are available now until 2033, um, and then rebates will be rolled out by states. Um, we're hoping as early as summer of this year, but we are not super sure on that. Um, I'm going to be going over two of these programs today. Um, you can see that they're identified with little electric bulbs, the electrification and efficiency tax credit, and the electrification and appliance rebates. But you can see that there are so many consumer-facing programs um, available through the IRA that cover a really wide variety of projects. So the first is going to be home energy efficiency and weatherization tax credit. So this started in January of 2023 for the next 10 years. All consumers, as long as they're filing taxes, are able to file a tax credit for 30% of the cost of qualified projects up to $1,200 a year annually. So this can be spread out over multiple tax years. Um, I'm not going to read all these <laughs> numbers and out to you, but I do want to highlight home energy audit, which is a really thorough assessment of your home's weatherization, efficiency, and overall building envelope. We always wanna recommend this as the first step to home electrification so that your appliances that you're spending money on and putting in are able to run at their full capacity. Um, I also wanna highlight that this tax credit covers up to $600 for an electrical panel upgrade. So some folks, especially if they live in an older home are going to need upgrades to accommodate some of the appliances that we're gonna be talking about that are covered by these rebates and they may need an electrical panel upgrade. So that's been kind of designed into this program. Um, there's also a one-time $2,000 tax credit for upgrading space and water heaters that does not count towards the annual cap of $1,200. So this could include anything from for space and water heating, like a heat pump or a heat pump water heater. Um, energy efficiency is going to be so key as part of our transition off of gas. It's going to ensure that we're using less energy to begin with, that our appliances run more efficiently and help people ultimately save money. Um, if people's homes are poorly insulated and sealed, electrification, even with how efficient these technologies are, can lead to bills going up and can contribute to energy burden, which is something we really want to avoid. We also know that there are health benefits associated with electrification or energy efficiency and weatherization. So it's really important that people understand how necessary EE and weatherization is and to take advantage of these tax credits. The IRA also includes funding to help low and moderate um, income residents to transition away from gas over the next 10 years. So these programs are going to be implemented by the states and we'll likely not see them roll out until the summertime. The Department of Energy has a website where you can check the status of your state application, just if you're interested in seeing where your state is kind of in the process. And they are also likely going to be implemented as point of sale rebates. So it's really going to function more like a coupon rather than a rebate. So hopefully that will make them easier for consumers to access. But because they are point of sale, they can't be retroactively applied. Um, this rebate program, like the tax credits, also includes updates to your home that might be necessary to accommodate appliances like updated electrical wiring, updated electrical panels, and so on. Um, the percentage of the appliance cost that can be covered is determined by a consumer's um, average median income or AMI. So if a consumer falls into 80% of AMI, they're eligible to claim a rebate for the full cost of electric appliances up to the caps that you see on your screen. Um, and if consumers fall into 150% of AMI, they're eligible to claim a rebate for up to 50% of the cost of appliances, appliances up to these caps. So it's important to note that these are the maximum caps or the maximum rebates available, and most people won't qualify for the full 1400. Um, and that these rebates, even at their caps, may not cover the full price of appliances. Um, Multi-family buildings can also qualify for um, these rebates if more than 50% of their residents are low or moderate income. Um, these rebates are designed for low and moderate income households with the idea that folks that can afford to electrify are already starting to do so. So we want to make sure that everyone is making this transition together. So it's really um, important that this information reaches the people that it's designed for, right? We know about the health concerns around gas, the increased energy burden left 
um, for people in the gas system as more and more people start electrifying. And these appliances can last for decades. So it might be another 20 years before people have to make that kind of decision again. So it's going to be really important that people are aware of these rebates um, and take advantage of them. Um, utility providers have their own incentives as well. So this is an example, Not I have heard that comment lowered some of these incentives recently, so don't hold me to these numbers, but I, this will give you kind of a ballpark and an example of what a utility um, provider might offer in terms of rebates and discounts. You can see that it covers the same technology uh, and upgrades as the tax credits and rebates, which will allow for stacking. Um, utility rebates also have their own kind of set of requirements. So for example, Combat requires you to work with someone that has undergone training and is part of their database. Um, they also might have requirements on minimum efficiency. So it's important to make sure that your project fits the requirements of the IRA and of the utility program if you intend on stacking. So this is just an example of how different incentives might be stacked. So if someone has um, was at or below 80% of AMI and was interested in getting an air source heat pump, they could access the home energy efficiency and weatherization tax credit for a one-time $2,000 credit. They could access the electrification and appliance rebate for up to $8,000 and the common utility discount for up to um, $1,400. So all together with all that stacking, it could accumulate to up to $11,400 in savings. So that is quite a lot of money. Um, Stacking is definitely something that's a little more complicated, but definitely something we encourage doing. Um, folks can take advantage of all these opportunities kind of at once. And that brings me um, to the end of my slides. I just want to leave you with some resources. I have um, two of Cubs guides, our electrification guide and our IRA guide. I think these are both really great consumer facing resources. Um, and I've also linked a calculator from Rewiring America, which is any other nonprofit. It allows you to type in your income. It will give you um, a really great layout. Um, uh, everything is presented in a way that is super easy and accessible. So definitely a great consumer resource as well. And I've also um, left my email. If you're located in Illinois, um, we'd be happy to come speak to your residents about building electrification, utility savings, solar, and so many other topics. Um, and that is it for me. Thank you, Julie. Well done. Really um, impressive to see everything assembled so cleanly. We've got one um, question in the chat from Heidi about applying these credits to multifamily uh, dwellings, apartment buildings. Um, I know that the um, rebates, so the electrification and appliance rebates can be applied to uh, multifamily units, as long as the majority of the tenants are considered low or moderate income. Um, for the home EE and weatherization tax credits, I'm I'm not sure off the top of my head, but I can get back to you, Heidi. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. And then I uh, just want to endorse the um, Cub visits to your community. We worked with you guys a lot on uh, promoting energy efficiency, the um, uh, customer uh, bill clinics. So if you uh, just contact you, if a municipality would like to have a presentation in their library or to their sustainability commission, would you be the right person for that, Joey? Yes, and if I am not the right person, I will connect you to the right person. Okay, take, take advantage of that uh, opportunity to all of you. So any other questions on IRA topics before we close out with just a few, um, few comments here? We do have questions. Um, so, Elena, in the chat there, do you want to speak up there? Um, hi, everyone. I'm just sharing what I know about the um, timeline for these rebates that Joey just shared. Um, and I don't know if there's anybody else uh, from the state on the call, but uh, as far as I know, the schedule will likely be uh, rolling out in the first quarter of 2025, just given the timeline be to you know, submit application to DOE and then getting their um, back and forth on the comments and then uh, procuring the design and the implementation. Thank you um, for that. Tim's got a specific question about air source heat pumps and what about ground source heat pumps? So Joey, I don't know if you know the answer to that. 
Um, so ground source heat pumps are part of the solar and solar tax credit program. So that is eligible to anyone who owes taxes um, and it, you are eligible for up to 30% of project costs. Great, thanks. Well, then you have a specific invitation there from um, Naperville. So you can, I'll let you, <laughs> little Joey fan club there. So going on in the chat, take a look at that. Thank you. Okay, so um, to close out, um, and thank you, Angela, for comments in the chat too. So um, just to, to wind down here a little bit, um, I did want to give a, a update on the Priority Climate Action Plan. So from the, the January meeting, we did talk about um, the, the plan, uh, which will allow for um, every jurisdiction, eligible jurisdiction in our Chicago metropolitan statistical area, which not only includes um, a Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus membership in the seven county region, um, there are two additional counties in Illinois and then uh, four counties in Indiana and Kenosha County in Wisconsin that are part of that MSA. So the caucus is the lead for creating a priority climate action plan um, by March 1st. Yes, I'm enjoying that deadline and we're cranking on it. Um, but everyone then who is in that region um, is eligible to apply for funding uh, as long as we include that priority, that strategy um, that covers your project in our plan. Uh, so that is going quickly um, and I'm writing the plan uh, currently, but I do have the priority climate action strategies um, up for feedback. So I'm going to confirm because Cheryl has been multitasking during the meeting. Um, and Cheryl, if that is ready to share, I'm going to let you put that link in the chat. But we do have a little bit of time uh, for feedback. And just to fill everybody in, um, in the January meeting, we had a, a well, back even further. Um, we put out a call for projects. CMAP managed the invitation of that. We had a very well attended webinar and we were seeking uh, to find out who's applying. So we got good feedback from um, some organizations um, that have said, yes, we're going to apply uh, and try to advance those projects and be in touch with them so that everybody who has a project that seems competitive um, for the CPRG funding gets a chance to be included in that plan. So we've been in touch with everyone and we think we have priority climate action uh, strategies that are going to be inclusive of that. But just want to give it a once over, not a lot of time for changing that. And then also when you look at that, uh, the priority climate action plan to make it as a priority um, in the short term PCAP or priority climate action plan due March 1st, it needs to be something that is large and transformative in terms of emissions reductions that is not going to be covered by other funding sources. For example, EV charging isn't in the priority strategies just because we're pretty flush with, uh, with funding here um, in Illinois and with the utility rebates. Uh, for EV chargers. But if there's a project that falls in the funding gap, large and transformative um, emissions reduction can be done in a five-year period, provides benefits for low um, uh, income and disadvantaged communities. Um, and somebody wants to, to apply for grant funding for that, it's going to be a, uh, included as a priority climate action strategy. So um, Cheryl's uh, just got it posted up on the web for the purposes of sharing with you all, but she'll get an email out later today that says what that looks like. And if you would, um, the, the turnaround time, since this is due um, next Friday, again, please don't uh, nitpick at the um, at the phrasing of that. Just realize we got to get this finished and we want to unlock a funding opportunity um, for every jurisdiction in the region that, uh, that again, has a good, strong competitive program. So um, thank you to those of you who have provided input thus far and uh, give us a, uh, um, some feedback. Cheryl, did you want to say anything else about that? I think you've said it all in the chat there. Um, yeah, I've pretty much said it all in the chat and we'll be just um, updating that and sending that out to the Environment Committee today. Mm -hmm. So it's, it'll be in the form of a, a, a Google form survey just to get your feedback on those strategies. Everything that is not included as a priority um, climate strategy in the short-term PCAP for March 1st will be included into the Comprehensive Climate Action Plan. So please don't feel like if your um, project isn't considered a priority, it's not a priority for short-term 
um, competitive funding from the CPRG. That's all that means. It doesn't mean, for example, um, the waste uh, sector, we've heard a lot from folks. We can't really demonstrate the large transformative emissions reductions um, in the short term, nor have we heard that there are some immediate projects that are going to compete for funding. So it's not included. It doesn't mean that uh, waste reduction, composting, um, and recycling isn't a priority. It absolutely is. It's just not a PCAP priority. So please don't be uh, hurt if your, your project didn't make the cut. Any questions on that? And then we'll take your, your feedback in the form. Um, and finally, for the next meeting um, uh, in March, uh, as part of this PCAP process, um, we really looked at uh, co-pollutants and, and emissions reductions um, and have uh, gotten to know LADCO, which is a lake area district, uh, Lake Ladco. I'm sorry. It's a uh, it's a, a multi jurisdictional organization that monitors air quality. Uh, has some excellent data scientists and looking at the um, inputs for air pollution. Looked at a lot of things where municipalities could be helpful. Um, and they a lot of these uh, suggestions align with the Greenest Region Compact and the Climate Action Plan. Uh, so we'll be joined by Ladco uh, next month, um, where you can learn about uh, things that municipalities can do that can also be really beneficial. Uh, for air quality, and Cheryl put the chat for a Zoom registration in um, in the chat there. So any closing comments or questions, anything we haven't addressed that you wanna wanted to say? And if not, I really wanna thank our speakers. This was a really rich presentation. It's exciting um, to be, uh, to be uh, joined here with cutting edge thought leaders um, at the national level and then locally that are really working to help us navigate um, the direct pay and appreciate your enthusiasm and expertise that has made a topic um, really exciting for us. And it sounds like there's so much promise there. And again, thank you to Joey uh, for joining us locally and offering to provide assistance um, as these this information rolls out. So thank you all for attending. <laughs>